The relationship you develop with the patient is one of the most loving, giving, honest relationships you can have. That person has entrusted you. You've shared the worst and you share the best. I grew up wanting to be a nurse, never wanted to be anything else. I was probably three years out of nursing school and I was working in a cardiac intensive care unit. One of my patients had suffered a large heart attack and I was in our med room, which was open to our nurse's station. And I was laughing and talking with my coworkers and not really paying a lot of attention to what I was drawing up in the syringe. I went into her room and started injecting the medication. And one of the nurses from the um, desk called out and said, Gwen, look at your monitor. And her blood pressure had just plummeted. I looked down at my syringe and I realized I had double dosed her on this very powerful blood pressure medication. I was crying and the patient actually took my hand and comforted me and said, honey, everything will be okay. I'm standing there in the back of the room watching my teammates try to salvage a patient that I harmed. I had potentially killed another human being simply because I wasn't paying attention. It, it was one of the worst nights of my life. It's, I'll never forget it. We were able to stabilize her. Um, it took about four hours. Stayed there about six days and then she did go home. I questioned whether I was fit to be a nurse. You know, was I morally fit to take care of other human beings if I could be so careless? So I went into grief counseling. I felt renewed. I felt like, okay, this is my fate to be not only a nurse, but a champion for patient safety. We built one of the first quality circles in my unit and we looked at medication administration, how we care for patients, fatigue in nurses. And when a nurse made a mistake, we had a team that would talk with her. We experienced less errors. We developed more processes around checking. We built in redundancy into our systems that we didn't normally have. It took about three years to get all of that set up. She came back to our unit about six months later, um, and she was dying. Her heart was so damaged that it just could not sustain her. And I said, remember we in the hospital before? Uh, I'm the nurse that gave you too much medicine. And I said, I want to tell you how sorry I am, um, but I also want to tell you how much I learned. And she reached up and kind of cupped my hands in hers and said, honey, I told you it was gonna be okay. And as long as you learned something, that was great. You know, her name was Shirley. And every time I start a new project, I think about Shirley. She has inspired me for a lot of my 30 years in nursing. Good morning, everybody. I'm Marty Hatley. I'm the uh, CEO uh, and president of Project Patient Care, a Chicago-based uh, coalition of, that brings the voice of the patient into quality improvement work. I also serve as the um, uh, co-director of the MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety, and I've had the great honor to uh, serve on the Patient Safety Movement Foundation Board of Directors. Um, the video that you just saw is something we wanted to start with today. It's the Gwen Cox video. That's what we're going to refer to it as because everybody in the U.S. right now is talking about the criminal conviction of nurse Deronda Bott for a deadly medication error at Vanderbilt University. And much of that commentary has focused on the fact that while that error was unintentional, nurse Bott was terminated from her employment and lost her license. 
In contrast, the error in, in the, that Nurse Cox made in the video we just saw had a very different trajectory. Um, that nurse, Gwen Cox, was not fired, terminated, or prosecuted. And it appears to have motivated her to become a better nurse and her organization to become much more focused on prioritizing patient safety. The event led to improvements such as quality circles and teams that looked at medication administration and fatigue. So I'm joined today uh, in this discussion about regulation and the role of regulation in improving patient safety by just a fantastic um, uh, panel. We've just had the chance to catch up and talk about what we wanna talk about today. We could barely stop ourselves from uh, commenting, but I wanna introduce them to you here today. Um, and I'm gonna do it in alphabetical order. So starting with uh, my friend, Karen Feinstein, who is the president and chief executive officer of the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, a long veteran in the uh, patient safety uh, shaping and programming and thinking in this country. A lot of that work has been done through the Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative, a program of, of the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, where a lot of your quality and safety improvement work has happened over the years. Welcome, Karen. It's so wonderful to be with you today. Um, second is Michelle Schreiber, uh, a physician who's the director of quality measurement and value-based uh, incentives group at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, I get to work with Michelle as she, um, on an annual basis, kind of takes CMS's measures under consideration through the NQF process uh, and uh, gets the feedback from that group about what we measure. Karen, or Michelle's job at CMS really is about measurement and looking at, um, at how CMS can improve uh, safety. And she's a, a real leader in this space with a deep background uh, before you went to CMS as well. And then Robin Betts is um, the vice chair of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation Board of Directors, also vice president of safety, quality, and regulatory services at the Kaiser Foundation Hospitals and Health Plan for the Kaiser Permanente uh, section in uh, Northern California. So welcome, Robin. It's uh, wonderful to have you here with us as well. So let's get back uh, to that Tennessee case that seems to be all anyone is talking about in the patient safety movement. Wherever you go now, it's very, very top of mind. I just wanna throw this um, question open to uh, everyone on the panel about what are your thoughts about the impact of that Tennessee case on both patient safety and the profession of nursing? Um, why do we think that the responses of the two organizations were so different? Robin, why don't we start with you? I know you're passionate about this issue. Thank you. Well, Marty, the, the criminalization of medical errors could really have a chilling effect on reporting and process improvement. You know, for all of us, the safety of our patients and our employees is really our highest priority. And we're all committed to maintaining an environment where processes, procedures, and technology are really focused on providing the safest possible care. And it's really essential that medical errors are reported in, in a transparent and timely manner so that they can be appropriately addressed and that systems and processes can be continually improved. Redonda did the right thing. Uh, she immediately reported uh, and she continued sharing throughout the organizational investigation, her actions and mindset. So the organization could surface you know, any system issues of which there were many. And it wasn't until uh, criminal actions were taken that Redonda had to consider the notion that she um, should take action to protect herself. And unfortunately, her transparency was treated by the cross prosecution as an admission of guilt. You know, at a time when all healthcare professionals have felt the stress of providing safe, high quality, compassionate care during this historic pandemic, it's more, it's more important than ever that these same professionals feel supported by systems and practices that promote accountability, fairness, transparency, and continual process improvement. We need their voices more than ever versus having an environment that instills fear of transparency. Thank you, Robin. I think I mispronounced uh, uh, Ms. Vaught's name too. It's Redonda, not Deronda. So I apologize to that. Uh, I mean, we wanna acknowledge her as a, as a colleague and a whole person um, and get her name right in the process. Karen, you've got your thoughts on, on the impact of this case. Well, I was struck by one thing. I read the chats and all the online articles and among nurses, there's been a mixed reaction, which I didn't expect. I, I think this is going to do a lot of damage. I, I don't want to in any way minimize that. 
bringing criminal charges for a mistake is not something that is going to reassure nurses who are, you know, on the borderline of um, retiring. Um, so I, I'm a little uh, concerned about that. I, I will say, though, looking at the two different cases uh, and, and the responses of these systems, there is a big difference in um, Nurse Cox's case. It was one mistake by one nurse. Um, and it wasn't one that necessarily violated all the protocols and procedures. It was a mistake. In the case of Redonda, you have a much more complicated issue because there were so many failures in the system by so many people. It wasn't just one nurse, which makes her criminalization to me a little more bizarre, but also maybe a system didn't even know how to deal with the fact that their procedures and, and protocols were violated all along the way and it made it much more complicated and maybe less easy to deal with. So before I, I turn to you, I just do want to remind us all that this is a case that's still in process. Um, Ms. Vaught has not been sentenced yet, to our knowledge. Um, there's likely to be an appeal. I know um, CMS has been involved in, um, in an investigation of this uh, event, but, um, but it's not over. And I don't know how much you can say, but I would welcome your thoughts about the impact of the case in general. Thanks, Marty. I really appreciate that. So it is true. CMS did an investigation. It's been posted online. And I think what's important to remember is that in that CMS investigation, there were multiple errors that were found, as Karen pointed out. There were problems within the hospital systems. There were problems along multiple places. And that is what is common in healthcare. It is rarely just a problem of one person doing one thing. But most of uh, the issues that lead to, to serious uh, patient events and, and harm events, they're systematic. And we really need to take a systematic and deeply embedded approach to this. CMS really is committed to deeply embedded safety systems that operate where people feel comfortable speaking up and being transparent for reporting, because that's the only way we will learn of events and be able to prevent them and operate where leadership and governance also prioritize and really lead for safety and quality. So thanks. Sure, thank you. You know, another surprising dimension of this case is that the healthcare organization at least allegedly failed to report this to regulators or to accreditors. And it's alleged um, that the coroner was led to believe that the patient in this case, Charlene Murphy died from natural causes. So Michelle, I'm gonna to turn to you again. I, I know you uh, can't comment uh, about the specifics, but you and your colleagues, Lee Fleischer and colleagues from, um, from uh, CDC published a powerful piece in the New England Journal in February of this year, really calling for increased accountability and transparency in the healthcare system as a, as a safety solution. Um, what can you say about what CMS will be doing to really kind of walk that talk of, of accountability and transparency? You know, it's true that during the COVID pandemic, we really noticed a decline in patient safety. Healthcare acquired infections, for example, went up 40%. That was published by the CDC. And our own internal data showed a rise in complications, increasing patient falls, increasing pressure ulcers, as well as a decline in patient experience scores. And so that's why CDC and CMS really felt compelled to put out a call to action for a refocus on patient safety. It feels like we lost some of the gains that we've had in the last decades. Um, and we hope that, that everybody will join in this recommitment to safety. Our safety systems, this is getting back to what I was speaking about before, it isn't just one thing, it isn't one person, it is an entire system of safety communications training, leadership, governance, deeply embedded processes that, that don't evaporate under times of stress. And so CMS, um, as well as CDC, is looking to take much more of a leadership role in terms of uh, promoting patient safety. We know that IHI and AHRQ have a wonderful uh, guideline out around patient safety. World Health Organization has another one out. And we're looking to promote those activities and, and really, again, refocus organizations so that we're all recommitting to safety. I do want to say another um, way of doing that that we haven't uh, spoken of yet 
is how do we engage the patients in safety? How do we allow for patients, for example, to be able to report safety errors and patients to be able to hear about this and be engaged in the conversations and to be allowed to have their medical records so that they can look at them and, and comment on them? So engaging the patients, I think, is another critical aspect of uh, patient safety. Sean, I'm so glad you mentioned that because, as you know, I'm um, very active in that patient engagement space, including being a co-founder of an organization, a network of patient advocates called Patients for Patient Safety U.S. And, and you know, when we look at the landscape now, we've spent so much of our time trying to be a good partner, you know, trying to be a partner during the, the patient care journey, trying to be a partner in improvement work. We, we haven't done as much in advocacy. And that's, I think, where you're really going to see patients stand up now and already are seeing it as, as advocates for change, because we can sometimes just say things that um, people in organizations, um, whether it's government or private sector, can't say. Um, Michelle, Robin, I want to, I'm sorry, uh, Karen and Robin, I want to turn to you because, as we know, CMS has a lot of tools uh, to uh, make things happen, conditions of participation, um, payment, just uh, among others, contracts. Um, but your thoughts on whether there are things that CMS can do, we'll, we'll give Michelle some feedback here, or additional things they might do to better motivate organizational leaders to report the way we expect them to do. What more can we use regulation to do to get the kind of transparency and accountability we want? I would love to see, I, I like what Michelle had to say, we're all cheering in the patient uh, safety world. I think we have to get better among regulators and accreditors at understanding whether the boards are really governing and the C-suite is really leading to create a safe organization. I think if you wait for a whistleblower, a random whistleblower, which happened in the uh, case at Vanderbilt to come forward, that's not, that's not the best way to do this. You wanna prevent something from happening. And that is, I think there has to be a way the governing board, the regulators and accreditors talk directly to people on the front lines privately and find out what worries them, what seems hypocritical. Um, look at all the overrides of good practice that happened at Vanderbilt, all the procedural um, discrepancies. And I think we have to find a better way. It's not just a simple regulation, but how do we understand what is really happening in an organization, both at the governing board level, because they're responsible, but also for the regulators and accreditors. It's something more profound than hoping that a whistleblower will come forward, what, a year after the incident. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, Karen. You know, I think it's, it's, those are all great things to say, but how do you operationalize it? And, it, you know, as a person who works in a healthcare system, you really have to and what we do is we establish, you know, various standard work and protocols and workflows so that information does flow up to our board. And I don't know that that exists everywhere. We have a very engaged board that do hold us accountable to quality and safety. And we have um, a, a notification uh, policy and the things that have to be escalated to the board. And we have systems that make it easy, for instance, uh, critical issues with our medical staff go into a system and we have a process so that they can clearly see how our credentialing and privileging um, committees followed up. And for serious safety events, the same thing. What is the protocol uh, within your organization to escalate information to your board because they are the ones who can assure that your, your efforts are resourced, evaluated, and monitored for sustainment, hold everyone accountable. And they are very powerful if they're used and empowered to govern the way that they need to. So, Robin, I want to pick up on this because you mentioned, and actually Karen did too, um, governance. So, governance, I guess, is a kind of is a kind of regulation uh, for what happens within an organization. And um, what I want to probe with you is just the culture of safety because we've been talking about a culture of safety in this country for uh, at least two decades, maybe closer to three, and how crucial it is to preventing harm. I mean, your organization has really invested in a culture of safety. You talk about it a lot, people like you represent it in the world. I think you're known for it. So what is the role? I mean, you've spoken a bit about governance, but is, is there anything regulation can do from your point of view to kind of uh, incentivize or require or, 
or catalyze the culture of safety work that some organizations seem to do and others not so well? Uh, that's, I think it's a great question. And I think we can't forget that our regulators have been with us all along the way. I, I you know, I'm kind of sad that healthcare um, required the push um, it did from regulators uh, versus establishing our own self-regulation that we've seen in other industries. So, you know, when you look back at Tara's Human, when that was published now uh, to now, our regulators have funded performance improvement, aggregated safety performance data at a, a really broad scale so we can uh, benchmark against each other and established well-vetted industry-based and um, evidence-based safety operation standards and really ensure that we have the governance structures. It is a requirement. Our governing boards are responsible for um, uh, the quality and safety of the organization. And when our regulators come in, they look for that accountability. They trace through the activities uh, of, of, of activities up to the board. And when those don't exist, we are held accountable. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think we can continue to have that partnership and on, you know, there's the regulation side and then there's the collaborative side where we have our regulators and con continuing to promote education, especially of our boards is really critical. Karen, I'm gonna to get to you about culture of safety in a second, but I'm remembering that Michelle, uh, before you went to CMS, you were at Henry Ford and you were one of the um, developers, one of the reviewers or developers that worked to develop the latest IHI um, um, guidance on what would uh, on, on optimal practices, best practices for uh, boards in healthcare. Is there anything you know that you can think of given that expertise that boards can do more of or do better? You know, there are many things that boards can do to be engaged in quality and safety. I think the first one, frankly, is willpower and actually a commitment in placing that as one of their highest priorities, if not in my own personal opinion, the highest priority in, in healthcare. What is more important than taking care of our individuals and our patients in the safest, highest quality, most equitable way? Um, beyond willpower, you know, there are lots and lots of uh, best practices around high reliability processes that can be put in place, um, daily safety huddles, deeply embedded communication structures. So there are many things that can be put in place, but boards have to make sure that those are in place and make sure that there are resources that are allocated to the organization and that they're hearing about what is going on so that, that that in and of itself promotes these activities. So I think there's a great deal that it can do. And, and I I have a deep belief that, that leadership and governance really is, is absolutely essential in establishing the culture of safety, even tracking the culture of safety, doing those uh, you know culture of safety uh, feedbacks it, it um, I, I think that's where it starts, but it has to permeate to the front line. So this culture of safety has to go from leadership to the front line and frankly back. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to uh, add to that too. One of the, uh, the most wonderful things from my point of view about the partnership of patients is the metrics they put into place for person and family engagement. One of which was do you have people who identify primarily as a patient or family member on your board of directors? And when we surveyed, baseline surveyed about that, there was massive variation in the country. There were, there were some communities, some states where everyone had a, had a patient on their, on their, it was just part of the culture and then others where it just wasn't. So I'm personally rooting for that to be uh, a metric at some point in time. But Karen, I now need to turn to you because you and I have had this conversation uh, a couple times over the last couple of weeks about the culture of safety and how long we've been waiting for it and how, I don't wanna pick just on Tennessee because these cases, you know, we, we get a blockbuster kind of case like this um, every year or every year or two that hits the, the papers where you just see an organization not stepping up the way we think they would be after, after um, 20 years of encouraging a culture of safety to be adopted. So what do you have to say? I don't wanna steal your thunder. You're on mute, Karen. Totally cynical. Um, I, I've been waiting two and a half decades for this culture to emerge. So first of all, payment, you want a culture of safety, 
You'll get a culture of safety when we pay for healthcare differently. We all could talk about value-based payment, but I'm sure that's another panel. But it is, it is, um, in, uh, it is so intrinsic to the culture of safety that I can't separate them. But quite aside from that, surprising to all of you, I'm going to come down on the side of some regulations. Some things shouldn't be allowed. An example, we regulated crash carts, and people adhered to that. We haven't regulated defibrillators. There were so many, and, and you know, there were so many <laughs> things in this particular incident that should have been regulated. But one is, how can you be administering a paralytic high alert agent and not have the rescue med there? I, I mean, I don't understand that. And how can you be monitoring the waiting room when that agent's been um, already administered when you can't tell whether the patient is in cardiac distress or um, brain failure. So, you know, I look at some things that I think at this point, I'll take defibrillators, that's actually my favorite. Every year our system deals with defibrillator deaths. Standardize them for heaven's sakes. Standardize things that should be standardized. So you may be surprised, I'm coming down on, on the side of the regulators here. Thanks, Karen. I want to get back to the technology point in just a second, but be before we leave this sort of culture segment, I'm just cognizant that everybody on our panel today is, is from the United States, and we do have an audience that is global. And one of the, the global vectors right now that's very prominent in patient safety is the new Global Patient Safety Action Plan put out by the World Health Organization last May, so just about a year ago. And it really, you know, it looked at the continuing challenges. It looked at what we've learned over the last 20 years. And they come down really hard on, not hard, but really strongly, I should say, on national governments really having to step up and, and lead to create that culture and to create the systems. Michelle, you're our representative from the, from the federal government today. What, what more do you want to say about, the, about what CMS can do or DHHS can do? to really kind of create that culture, not just in the innovators and the, and the early adopters and the, really, the organizations like Robbins with really committed leadership, but system-wide. I think that there are a lot of things that are in place already, um, maybe more deeply embedded and, and widely spread, but remember the conditions of participation do establish an absolute floor for quality and safety. That's the purpose of the conditions of participation and organizations have to participate in evaluating their quality and safety, and they're surveyed for that as well. There's been the quality improvement organizations, the uh, Partnership for Patients, for example, that has provided support across the country, in COVID in particular, provided incredible support to nursing homes for patient safety, um, and uh, have provided support in many activities and really helped drive patient safety as well as then the quality measures that we have that allow us to look and compare one hospital, one facility, one provider to the next with uh, you know, deeply vetted quality measures that have been embedded in now over 20 um, quality, quality value-based programs that uh, tie performance to payment. Now you could argue maybe we should tie more performance to payment, for example. You could argue that maybe there should be more regulation, more validation of the data. But others then will argue that we're already too intrusive. And so there, there's a middle point in there somewhere. It can't just be government though that's going to solve this issue though. There has to be responsibility at all levels, both local and state governments, um, boards that we've already talked about, individual <laughs> providers. So I can't say it can be just government, um, but we certainly have tried at CMS to be leaders in this role. And we are working very hard to align, especially across CDC, AHRQ, CMS, to continue to promote and, and lead in patient safety. And, and in fairness, I think uh, the World Health Organization uh, is just uh, prescribing what you set out, government leading, but multiple stakeholders all having, having roles, educators, product manufacturers, uh, accreditors, patients, all having uh, responsibilities to play. Okay, thank you. Um, Karen, I'm gonna go back to you for this one too, because I know you're really active in this space through the, your work at the regional, through your work through the regional, the Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative. 
But technology, we've seen technology really uh, improve outcomes. I mean, I think the classic example is the pulse oximeter. I mean, when we look now at what's safer, everyone points to anesthesia, but it's been antiseptic hand gel, uh, CPOE, EHRs, a number of tools that have come out of the technology development sector that are improving uh, um, care. And I know you feel strongly about the fact that we have a lot of tools right now that can actually help us identify and prevent things before they happen. So we don't have situations like the Tennessee case. What more do you want to say about that? Oh, you know, you're, you're hitting my button, uh, one of my favorite topics, but you look at all the things that could have been prevented autonomously um, that should never have happened because we have the technology and we have the data now. To, to understand that these could have been prevented and to do something about it. It's also very frustrating to me, this is not an under-resourced center, um, but it, the year's 2022, we can land a little helicopter on Mars, little ingenuity hops around. And honestly, we could have prevented the override on the high alert paralytic medication. I think when you issue that, those meds, you should issue the counter med, the rescue med at the same time. Um, we should have ongoing assessment and maintenance of critical equipment that can be automatic. That does not have to be done by humans. That can be done autonomously. So sort out this common and generic name problem in just you know what the, the nurse entered. I mean, that, that could be fixed. The alert system. We've got to fix that. How many meetings do we go to? Everyone's been nodding their head at these large conferences I have that the alert system is so imperfect um, that the doctors and nurses just commonly ignore their alerts. Well, fix it. We have technologies and algorithms that could fix some of this. And I think of the many ways that we could have monitored that patient to know immediately that she was going in the wrong direction. Um, this is all so possible now. So my sense is these autonomous technologies, you know, the, the, the way that anyone in another industry would look at safety, they would be in place. You wouldn't even think about it. They would be in place so that, that the frontline staff doesn't have to constantly be thinking and checking and rechecking. That can be done now um, so that we build them a better airplane. We don't rebuild them. So let me let me invite uh, Robin and Michelle to comment too. What role could regulation play in making what you just said happen? I mean, what more could we use our regulatory tools to, to to really get every organization to be doing what you just um, outlined as possible? Michelle, yeah. Robin, Robin. Yeah, you know, I, I think we take too long. I, I look at tubing connect misconnections uh, where a tube feeding is connected to an IV. The male and female connection points were identical for years and years and years. And people died from tubing misconnections. And we tried to put in a standard work that would prevent that, such as, you know, when you do a nurse handoff, you trace the lines back to the, from the patient, from the, uh, the, the device. But that's a lot of uh, manual work. And of course, there's elements of potential human error because of the human factors involved in that process. And, but now, finally, the industry has responded and, 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 and the tubing manufacturers were mandated uh, to make those connections different, to make it easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing. I feel that, um, you know, our, that, that's, that our government agencies have been good partners in many ways with performance improvement. We had, uh, for instance, in the United States, the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services had their partnership for patients and they funded um, activities that re reduce hospital acquired conditions and readmissions. And we had incredible response to that. And I think that we could organize in such a way that we have more prompt uh, uh, identification and then expectations of implementation of, um, of corrective actions that permanently um, uh, protect patients from harm. I think we take too long in our processes. I can understand how people think that we take too long. On the other hand, I have to tell you, I, um, it's unusual for me to be on a panel where people are asking for more government intervention and more government regulation. <laughs> Um, there, there aren't a lot of people who necessarily uh, vote for that.
But I do think with all of these programs, we are trying to encourage and support through the QIOs, through the conditions of participation, through public reporting and transparency, and through payment policies. We're trying to support quality and safety. Um, but it again, it takes everybody to participate. And at the same time, look, I'm a big fan of standardization. Please don't get me wrong, but we have to support innovation as well and allow organizations to do what is right for their organization. Um, and so, although a lot of us would like to see more standardization, as Karen was talking about, um, we have to allow for innovation and we have to allow organizations to find their best way of doing things too. Jill, I just want to take I this opportunity. That, to, oh, go ahead, Robin. I, I just want to say, I don't know that necessarily takes regulation, but like I said, I've really appreciated the partnership um, and the support that we do get. And you, you commented on those, and I think just continued more of that is, is uh, very welcomed. And, and the investment of resources. I mean, uh, you know, we always want more resources, mm -hmm. but the partnership for patients, 80% of the, of the hospitals, uh, of the country's hospitals participated in that. And it was a, a real driver. It was a, a collaborative on steroids. Um, HRQ was the biggest funder of research on patient safety in the world. So we're, we're doing, um, you know, it's not like we're not doing uh, uh, anything here. We're actually stepping up in a number of ways and I'm appreciative. Um, also, uh, Michelle, for CMS leadership there. Um, we have about 15 minutes left before this wonderful session. I will have to sadly come to a close, but I do want to turn to a, an idea that's out there um, in a couple of different uh, formats, and that is the idea of a new national agency, a National Patient Safety Board, it's often referred to. Uh, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation has uh, kind of a call for a, a moonshot complete uh, model of, uh, of uh, a, a federal agency based on the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. Karen, you've got a more tailored approach that I know you've built an entire coalition around through, um, through the facilitation of, that you've done. Uh, and and it's, it's not a regulator. It would be an independent agency. Uh, you're referring to it as a National Patient Safety Board. There's a coalition that would um, essentially be a home for reviewing uh, patient safety events when they happen. Uh, what do you wanna tell us about that agency and its role? Well, I do wanna thank the patient safety movement for being such good friends and partners along this journey. Um, you know, we've tried so many things at our end at the Regional Health Initiative for 22 years now. And I'm, I'm looking for something that is a national home, that is an independent, nonpartisan national home, a think tank for ongoing research. Michelle, I love innovation. And by the way, the human factors people would tell you standardization and innovation are not in conflict. You, you standardize so that you can innovate. But I'm not sure innovation has to take place unit by unit, hospital by hospital, system by system. I think that we've made a mistake in healthcare. I think we've entrusted a lot of safety uh, innovation to the medical profession. I love my doctors. Um, I, I love the medical profession, but we're not engaging enough human factors engineers, people who are expert in AI and um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, uh, even advanced analytics, predictive analytics. There's so much we could be doing now to anticipate harm and make sure that we've eliminated as much harm as we can before it ever occurs. So the other problem you had, and you saw it in this case in Vanderbilt, we don't have a home with an open portal for, for patients and families who've encountered an error. So that how many times have we seen in cases, the family turned to litigation, they didn't wanna to turn to litigation, but they felt that the death of their loved one was in vain. And so the idea that there's a, a portal, a place where people can turn to say there's a serious problem. One thing we noted in Vanderbilt, there's nothing new about what happened there. And, and in fact, I, I just came from an Academy Health panel and I put that out there and everyone in the room was nodding their head. These two medications are confused. The problems they had are happening in other hospitals. What, what went on at Vanderbilt could go on and, and probably does go on in other places. But I think at the federal level, I'd like to have one home that could constantly 
not distracted with a lot of other issues that aren't safety issues. Focus the resources we have now in terms of technology and data on preventing harm before it occurs and working with the industry, working with the healthcare industry to come up with solutions that are so powerful that what happened at Vanderbilt couldn't happen. Karen, I'm going to turn to Robin next because I can see her nodding her head. But but before I do, quickly, how would an organization like the NPSB that has no regulatory power make a difference? I mean, what would be the mechanism for it actually um, creating change? Well, as you, Marty and Michelle and others who've been on this journey for years know, there was nothing new under the sun about this idea. So I'm, I'm totally humble. It's been it, for three decades now, someone has proposed um, or some organization, something like a national home. We chose the, the National Patient Safety Board, NPSB, because the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, has been so powerful in terms of bringing about an ongoing trajectory of safety in transportation. They have no regulatory power. They don't penalize, they don't sanction, they don't expose, but they bring together um, experts whose qualifications are so extraordinary, they couldn't be challenged. And they bring them together and come up with solutions that are endorsed often by the industry, but these solutions are so powerful that they can't be ignored. They are required by Congress to present them to the regulators. The regulators have to respond in 90 days. And so I think it's 80 to 90% of the solutions that came out of the NTSB have been adopted by regulators and are now standard practice in the industry. Robin, your thoughts, I've seen you nodding here. Yeah, you know, um, I I think an organization like this could really reduce uh, administrative burden for one thing. If we could establish a single set of reporting criteria, regulators from federal, state to county, uh, as well as the you know, the PSOs, right? They, if they, they all have variable, um, disparate taxonomies, um, and this, and, the, and they kind of want their own slice and dice, and this creates administrative burden that really takes away resource time from actual performance improvement activities. And it would be great to have a single reporting portal that um, could aggregate data and trends, surface industry vulnerabilities, especially considering the ever-changing environment of healthcare where we have new technologies, medicinal agents that are added to the environment that carry known and unknown risks. And they, this organization could provide con- also um, concurrent performance measurement versus the lagging data that much of our industry-wide data operates against. So I think like sunsetting uh, the, the PSOs and moving towards a national patient safety board model and then uh, from a federal to county level, the the uh, the responsibility would be uh, not to report all these places, but your responsibility is to participate in the National Patient Safety Board, who becomes a strong collaborator and advocate uh, with um, our regulators as we share across our learnings and promote the level of safety that we need for everyone. Thank you. Michelle, you might have a different opinion here. What are your thoughts about uh, a new uh, federal agency? I'm, I'm not sure that I can or will comment on the establishment of yet a new government agency. I will say that I think that there's opportunities even within the agencies that we have to do more standardized national reporting around error. HRQ, for example, does have a patient safety organization and they get some reporting, but they don't really get all of the national reporting I think that we're talking about here. Um, In providing deep analytic systems, once we have that reporting so that we can really track trends, look at trends and come up with recommendations. Reporting in a standardized way. I know the CDC through their NHSN is a great portal for reporting healthcare acquired infections. And they're looking to uh, um, report more patient safety data as well. So I think that there are opportunities to use what we have even more efficiently and more effectively. Um, But I don't know that I can comment on yet another agency. 
I understand. Uh, we actually did have um, uh, Paul Yang on this conference last year talking about the 15 year look back at PSOs too with some recommendations about how they could perform better. So uh, we'll wait to see what happens there. Michelle, I wanna stick with you. We have, we're, we're kind of, I wanna hit two more issues before we, we break today. One of them is the work that I know is a personal um, leadership uh, effort of yours to, to look at the role of structural metrics and really advancing priorities of the administration. So you have been the leader in uh, sort of guiding MQ, the, the NQF process on a structural metric on maternal and child health, and most recently on health equity, really getting commitments from hospitals to be working in this space. Tell us more about that. And, and can we hope that there might be some kind of approach like this on patient safety? Well, I will say that there are certainly uh, thoughts and conversations around something like that. You know, we recognize that there are people who don't really like structural measures, including NQF doesn't always support structural measures. But the truth is a structural measure is a commitment. It's a commitment that, you know, an organization is generally engaged in quality improvement, is actually looking at their data, their leadership and their governance is engaged we're talking about maternal safety. We're also talking about equity. And something similar for uh, safety could be uh, something that is considered. But we think structural measures actually change behavior. And really, they are the first commitment of any quality improvement process that any of us undertake is to ensure those things are already in place. It's the same almost PDSA model um, that involves a commitment from the beginning. You know, I've sat in, in, in the hospital um, work group of NQF, the Measures Application Partnership, where these have come up. And I know there's skepticism because they can be gamed. I mean, they're going to be the check the box kinds of concerns, but they do send a powerful signal um, out there that this is what we're prioritizing in this country. This is what we hope that organizations will commit to. And, you know, making that commitment, I think it would be really an important step, especially now where we see so much of the progress we've, we've made on patient safety lost in the last few years. Um, one last issue I'd, I'd like to get to uh, before we close today is nursing homes. I mean, we're coming out of a pandemic where we've just seen the rates of death in nursing homes um, um, pointing to big failures in infection control processes and other systems approaches to safety. Um, what should we expect to uh, in addressing this issue? Michelle, can we start with you again? Many of you probably saw President Biden's uh, State of the uh, Union and that subsequently there's been a long document that has been put out by the White House and supported obviously across HHS of a real commitment to obviously advancing equity and driving high quality, but particular for nursing homes because we saw what happened in nursing homes. Um, and there, there is a multi-pronged approach now to looking at nursing homes, to uh, ensuring that nursing homes have adequate uh, workforce and, and safety mechanisms in place, um, looking at staffing levels and staffing turnover, expanding the skilled nursing facility value-based purchasing programs so that payments are tied to performance. So there are multiple initiatives that are ongoing across CMS and HHS including ramping up what we've talked about earlier, quality improvement organization support, which was really vital during the COVID pandemic, where not only did we have QIOs that were helping, but surveyors were going out and providing guidance, as well as uh, oversight for best practices in nursing homes. So I think we can all expect to see a very robust uh, focus on ensuring quality and safety in nursing homes. Thank you for that leadership. I know uh, the quality conference that CMS does every year, that huge conference is happening soon and I hope to hear more there. We are close to the end of our time. We've got just a couple of minutes left. So I just wanted to see if, if uh, any of you have any last comments that you'd like to make about the session or anything else we've talked about today. Robin, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Marty. Um, I think there's a lot of um, policies in place and, and sanctions for failure and, and in reporting and, and to really incentivize us to mitigate issues. But um, so I don't know that we, we need more at this point, but thinking back to this, this Tennessee case, I hope our policymakers will evaluate that case and really look 
to establishing much stronger policy for quality protection so we can continue to have the learning systems that we've had up to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I mean, I, that was so well said. Karen, final thoughts from you. I, I'm going to finish with a comment about nursing facilities. We did a documentary on what COVID exposed in long-term care. And I wanna echo Michelle, we have a real crisis coming up when you look at our demographics. We have a shortage of nursing home beds and a tremendous challenge in keeping our best nursing homes going. And I'll only say that our foundation put $35 million into creating a great nursing home. And we closed it last year. We could not possibly, on the reimbursement we get, keep an excellent nursing home going. And we didn't want to run a low quality one. You cannot put all these requirements on nursing homes without changing the reimbursement. This isn't just a problem for our seniors. It's a problem for everybody of middle age who's going to have to find care for their parents. Yeah. Michelle, I, I wanna thank you, first of all, for just bringing the concept of equity into this discussion because we didn't spend much time on it, but the way in which CMS is connecting the issues of safety and equity, we're not gonna be able to meet our equity goals unless we have safe systems, I think is just admirable. Final, so thank you for that. And final thought you wanna leave our audience with today. My final thought is, as you know, over the next coming weeks, CMS will be unveiling the CMS National Quality Strategy. It really ties a lot of this together and it focus on improving outcomes, equity, front and center, safety, innovation, including advanced analytics, digital interoperability of data, and most of all, alignment and cooperation across the federal government and reaching out to all of our stakeholders, because we recognize we can't do this alone. It has to be all of us together. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I, I can't, I mean, it seems a little weird to say that I had fun today because our topics have been so serious, but it was just a great pleasure to work with you and talk with you today. And I, I'm sure uh, it will be of real interest and very provocative and stimulating to our audience at large as well. So thank you very much.